think that's an oil pipe, Rob. How about going half each if it is, yeah? I think we should donate half to BP. Okay. They need it. Sounds like a plan. Actually, it's leaking. I think they put it in in the first place. There's no, there's no easy, uh, easy ride here, and there's no way of dodging the fundamental fact that um, we've really to to get the pier to function properly and to get the anti-vibration features, we really do need a very, f uh, a very firm anchor uh, for, the, for the pier. And we do this by gluing, uh, by drilling the concrete basin and gluing bolts in, um, uh, studs into here and then bolting it down. We need to get about 160 to 200 kilos of torque onto each one of these nuts and that's pretty important. That's quite high. It is high, yeah. Uh, and we, we need that for a very specific reason, because of the, uh, the dynamic mechanical aspect of the pier. We need to energise that machine that, uh, um, that, that the pier actually is. And to do that, we need a very substantial subterranean counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So we actually need a big block of concrete underground. Now, this isn't something that really should worry anybody because in a way it's the cheap part of the operation. Um, but we, we basically need to create a founding block that's a metre square and at least a metre deep. It's a metric tonne. Yeah, that's right. We, we need a, basically a metric tonne uh, acting as a counter subterranean counterbalance for the pier to actually get the anti-vibration pier features to work. Now, you can cut corners and you, you can put a little less. If, if you've got difficulty digging a, a deeper hole, you can make the founding block slightly wider. But we found that, again, the critical figure is around about a metric tonne um, as a counterbalance weight. Um, ideas about isolating it are one of these things that also comes up in the amateur literature quite a lot. Uh, again, it's faulty thinking. There's not an awful lot of point in isolating the founding block too heavily. In fact, the more you isolate it from the planet Earth, the flimsier it's going to be. If you think about it for a minute, the biggest thing we've got in the picture mm. is the planet we're actually standing on. And what we really need to do is bolt this as firmly as we possibly can to the planet. And putting, you see people put foam rub around it and this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's not a very good idea, unless you've got anti-gravity concrete. If you're walking on concrete that's next to the pier foundation, vibrations, that concrete that you're walking on is going to compress the ground. Vibrations of you walking are going to go down into the ground, they're going to travel across the ground uh, through, the, through the dynamics of the subsoil and they're going to end up on the pier. The best way is to avoid moving around during imaging episodes. Mm. The idea of trusting your pier, you're fooling yourself. Yes, it's if you really that think I've actually found. Yeah. Any if movement? It just shows up. Anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. If you believe you've got an, iso an isolated pier, you're going to behave in such a way in the observatory that you're actually going to Im 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 imperil the quality of your, of, your, of your imaging views. Now, obviously, if you're, only, if you're only doing visual work, it's not too much of a problem. You can take liberties. Mm. But if you're actually doing high-resolution imaging, you're going to find that that uh, effect of your walking, people don't realise it, but merely standing next to a pier is going to cause the pier to tilt towards you. How is it going to do that? Well, it's going to do it because your weight is a very significant part of the old whole installation. Imagine we've got a ton of concrete underneath the ground. We've got um, a few stone of, of steel and the telescope on top of it. Divide your weight into that combined mass. It's a massive proportion of the overall weight. We're big, chunky animals. In my case, it's 80 kilos standing at one side. Okay, mine's a bit more, but <coughs> just 80 kilos is enough to actually get the, the whole pier to bend towards you about one and a half arc seconds. Now, we're not used to measuring things on that kind of scale, but bolting a telescope onto the pier is a fantastic way of, of measuring these minute distances. It certainly you is. Know, if, we were gonna, if we were gonna make a scientific experiment to see just how much you can bend a pier by standing next to it, Oh, and a telescope on it would be a great way to do it. Um, so really, what you need is less faith in the pier from that point of view, um, and more a good modus operandi in the observatory. So I'm glad you brought that up, but basically a mass of around about a metric ton underground is what's required to get the anti-vibration pier to work successfully. And again, if anyone think that, thinks that's a tough call, then you really need to rethink your whole attitude to mounting your telescope um, and just acknowledge that you're bouncing along the bottom. You're not, you're not trying to do the best job. Don't be too surprised if you don't harvest the best seeing conditions when it comes along. Let's take a look at uh, an astro engineering anti-vibration pier and its uh, natural habitat uh, actually in um, an observatory building uh, installed at the uh, Astronomy and Nature Centre. This is actually a 421 uh, pier type, 
uh, with a small extension on top of it here to accommodate to the refractors that are normally on this CQ6 uh, mounting. We're going to take a, a closer look at the um, point of contact with the founding block at ground level and just show you how the fasteners actually work to um, grab hold of this pier and hold it firmly to the ground. I mentioned earlier the importance of the um, architecture of the base plate um, being vital to uh, the quality of the connection with the ground anyway, being vital to actually energise the dynamic mechanical functions of the pier. And we'll just take a closer look at how that's actually achieved. You can see the um, studs uh, that have been put through into the concrete here. Um, you can only see the top part of them, but here, here they are. Um, it's a 200 millimeter long M16 uh, stud. And this is actually drilled into the concrete. So we drill a hole into the cured concrete. That hole is then partly filled with a resin anchor system, basically glue. So we're basically going to glue this into the cured concrete after it's gone off and after we've, uh, we've actually cast it. This is um, very similar to those two-part adhesives that you're used to where you mix an equal part of each. It's just that the whole mixing process is achieved by this rather ke uh, clever little uh, kind of Archimedes screw that we've got in the nozzle here that automatically mixes the glue um, as it's injected with a uh, caulking gun. Um, once the studs are in place, they, they'll actually dry uh, at, at typical average temperatures in summer, uh, really in about 25 minutes. The pier can be put in position and they can be torqued up um, uh, fairly gently initially and after 24 hours they can be fully loaded. We actually need to torque the, um, the nuts up quite high because we're actually looking to distort this first um, 200 millimetres of the pier uh, within the recovery limits of the steel. But basically um, we're actually going to basically bend this metal by loading these studs um, to, to quite a high torquage. And it's, that's an important part of the, um, the dynamic of the pier, that it actually functions as a machine and the energy that gets put in initially is through these stud uh, mounting points. That's that dull fud that we're actually looking for uh, when the anti-vibration pier is actually active.